Hello and uh, welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, an astonishing scientific breakthrough which promises to turn back the ageing clock. Then there's Harry Potter actress Fiona Shaw and a couple who've become very, very famous in the last two years, Paul and Rachel Chandler, talking of their terrifying kidnap by the Somali pirates. But we begin with a rare date. Apologies to those of you who are watching the repeat of our show, but today, this day, here and now, is 11, 11, 11. This Sunday is often referred to as Remembrance Day, a chance to remember and to reflect on all those who died in the world's many wars. But, if you don't have, but you don't have to look too far today to witness nations and people at war. There are at least 33 wars happening somewhere today. So is war inevitable? Is it sometimes, is it ever, a good thing? And who should bear most of the blame? People, politicians or nation states? Joining me today to give us further insight into the various facets of war is renowned professor of psychology at Stanford University, Philip Zimbardo. Also with us from Germany is acclaimed military historian Martin van Creveld. And with me here in the studio, Jonathan Steele, the British author and former chief foreign correspondent for The Guardian newspaper. Gentlemen, to all of you, welcome. Let me just start with the question we referred to there in the opening, and that is the, the question of, is war inevitable? Will it always be inevitable? Um, Martin, what do you feel on that basic point? My answer is no, provided that we can turn people into zombies, provided we can take the human feelings <laughs> away from them, provided we can make sure they don't feel angry, they don't feel greedy, they don't want revenge, they don't want more than there are, and of course, they don't want to protect that which is most beloved and most precious to them. Maybe that could be done. Thanks to modern advances in chemistry, in hormone research and so on, maybe it would not so uh, in the fairly near future be possible to deprive people of these feelings and turn them into automata. But as long as that does not happen, as long as, as we are sentient, feeling human beings, uh, I think myself that yes, war and violence are inevitable. What do you feel, Philip, there in uh, California, on the basis there of what Martin has said? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I guess I tend to agree with Martin because um, uh, war is really about ambition. It's about uh, people stuck in the past who want revenge for something that happened hundreds of years ago. Uh, it's about uh, politicians who are charismatic and often psychopathic, uh, who make their career by glorifying their nation. And they, the way you do it is by declaring a war against some other nation. Uh, you know, in one sense, um, we've really changed the conception of war. In the olden days, to go to war meant uh, the president of a country would have an official declaration of war against another country, and you knew the war was over when that other country officially surrendered. So one of the things we're seeing currently is the notion of the war on terrorism. It's really not a war because it's not a nation state against a nation state. It's a network of, of, of people, insurgents, if you will, and there is no one to surrender. So once there is a, a war, on, uh, once there is a terrorist um, uh, challenge, that goes on forever. And so for me, that's the new uh, inevitability. Terrorism will, is with us, I think, uh, in perpetuity. Jonathan. Well, I think the point that's really important is that one country is not at war all the time. It's true that probably at every minute in human history, war has been happening somewhere on the planet. But actually, in most countries, the default position is peace. War is a rare occurrence in most countries. Of course, you know, because we know bad news is news and good news is never covered, it always seems that war is sort of dominant and is really the normal day-to-day -day condition. But that's not the case. Even in Europe, we know perfectly well that these wars we've had, terrible wars, they're still the minority part of the last century. 
Yes, not not necessarily mi minority in, in their prominence or in the well, number in the of deaths they, they caused. If you add the First and the Second World Wars together, you're still only talking about something that was ten years, mm -hmm. and we, it's in a century that ten years isn't actually a, a huge amount of time. So it, it's important not to sort of think there's war going on all the time, uh, because as I keep saying, peace I think is the default condition, and what we have to try to do is to strengthen and lengthen the periods of peace and reduce the periods of war. But I absolutely agree with the two other people that will never reduce war to nothing. But that sort of mood in the, in the world, a mood of peace or whatever, is, is always going to be short-lived, isn't it? Well, I agree that not all places are always at war at the same time, or other, otherwise humanity could not exist. But I also think that uh, war is rooted very deeply in the feelings of human beings. And to be more specific about this, I believe that men love war, or else we wouldn't have it. And of course, that women love warriors. And that is why, or else we wouldn't have it. So no, we don't have war at all time, at all places at the same time, but war itself is a product of human ambition, uh, sorry, human emotion, including, as we heard earlier, human ambition. And as long as humans have feelings, as young as we are emotional beings, and I believe that we are emotional beings even before we are rational ones, as long as we are feeling emotional beings, there will be war. And speaking there as you were of, of men loving war and so on, I remember a conversation with Moshe Dayan who was, he was saying, I'm not saying that war is a good thing or whatever, but when you talk to people who've been in war, the war was for them the highlight of their entire lives. Not saying that war is great or anything, but it is great to some of the people who actually are acting in that war because, because they love it. You know and everybody knows the name of Z uh, Siegfried Sassoon and his anti-war poems. If you look at the letters he wrote, this great pacifist and war hater Siegfried Sassoon wrote to his family during the Battle of, sorry, the Somme, then you will find that he, he never felt so marvelous in his life. Right. And the same was true for his friend Wilfred Owen, exactly the same. Does that strike a chord with you, Philip? I mean, this attitude to war, the yes, enjoyment absolutely. of war? No, but see, it's not the enjoyment of war. It's the enjoyment of the combination of uh, terror, fear, arousal. And in some way, so uh, uh, Martin's absolutely right. For many people, the highlight of their life was being in the military. Uh, and it's the same thing for uh, men who've been in uh, sports teams, uh, for example, in co certainly college teams, football teams. It's, it's the peak experience. Partly it's a, a unique kind of male bonding where, where uh, your life is at risk. So this is, this is really a, a kind of almost negative peak experience. Uh, where you're living on the edge, and it's it's arousal. It almost it's it's probably even more arousing than sexual arousal arousal for many men. War is the greatest fun you can have with your pants on. <laughs> well, sticking with war for a moment, <laughs> with or without your pants on. Um, I mean, people say that a war is a war of choice, or it's a war of necessity. Are those the sort of divisions between us, the types of war and the motives for war that, that, you, that you would see, Martin? I think that war can be very enjoyable, and if it is not enjoyable, then probably something is wrong with it at the grand strategic level. Meaning, then you go, you are fighting for the wrong reason, or it's not going well, but uh, unless that is the case, yes, war can be very, very enjoyable. And in fact, from Homer to the present, and uh, not only Moshe Dayan, but any number of uh, men, including, including even priests in World War I, uh, have written about the, the way they enjoyed war. And also, once they got out of the war, once the war was over, they often spent the rest of their lives telling the sons and the grandsons how marvelous it all was and how much they enjoyed it. Over here to Jonathan. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, there's some very interesting research came out on the most recent war, which is Afghanistan, and about which I've written a book recently. And that is that 
they did surveys of the post 9-11 American veterans who'd fought in Afghanistan and uh, it turned out that 51 percent of them didn't think the war was worth fighting but nevertheless about 80 percent of them said it gave them new maturity new self-confidence and they got value out of it even though they didn't actually believe in the purpose for which the politicians had sent them to risk their lives people write about what is the future uh, of war um, Let's come to you at first on that, Philip. Um, what is the future? Will there be, obviously, different sorts of war, less or more war? We've agreed earlier on war will not be banished from this earth, that that's not practical. What is the future of war? All war is about old men sending young men to kill other young men for some, under the guise of a noble ideology, like uh, uh, spreading our better religion, our better politics, our better economics, or less noble, we want your land, we want your resources, we want your bodies as slave labor. Uh, but we don't want our men to die. We love, we love the glory of war, the same way we love the glory of football or soccer. Uh, so we'd like war without our side, our young men dying. And I think moving to technology is one way governments are trying to achieve that. That is, our men don't die because we send robots uh, uh, to kill the enemy. Right, drones, etc. What do you make of that, Jonathan, well, in, terms of this, in terms of this, the future of war? Well, I think the war has changed dramatically. I mean, yeah. the, the First World War, and that's why we're wearing poppies for Remembrance Day and so on, 90% at least of the people who died were troops in uniform. Civilians hardly any of them died. War since then has changed and most of these 33 wars that you mentioned at the beginning are wars where civilians get killed. Afghanistan, civil, far more civilians get killed than, than US or British troops or anybody else's troops. And I think that the point that Philip made that uh, the publics no longer accept um, casualties on their own side, it has gone to ex absurd lengths now. So that uh, the sort of protection of troops giving them absolutely the most guaranteed sort of tanks that no yeah. armor can penetrate and all the rest of it is absurd. I mean, you do take a risk when you go to war, and if you're going to sort of react in such a way that uh, you don't want any of your people to die, but you don't mind about civilians dying, I think you've got the, the thing wrong. It should be the civilians you're protecting and not the soldiers. Right. What do you make of that, Philip? Do you agree yeah, with that? Absolutely. I have. Yeah, I have to. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, the wars have shifted so that uh, the most vulnerable populations are the civilians. Uh, in, in Iraq, in, in Vietnam, uh, it was millions of, of citizens who died c compared to the number of Americans or Viet Cong uh, or, um, or Iraqi forces or insurgents. Uh, and, and civilians become collateral damage uh, rather than, you know, rather than, so, so I think in Iraq maybe 5,000 American soldiers uh, have, have been killed about that. Uh, and the estimates are hundreds of thousands, if not more, Iraqi civilians have died. Uh, and I think we have to reconceptualize uh, deaths of civilians as more than collateral damage, uh, uh, as human lives being taken for some cause. And often the cause is really not justified. Right. Martin, a cl concluding word from you too, Martin. I would agree with everything Philip just said. I'm an Israeli. With us too, civilian lives have become much cheaper than soldiers' life. Whenever a soldier is killed, is killed, all hell is raised. Whenever a civilian is, is, is killed, uh, that is just part of the game. And that, to my mind, shows how much the words, the, 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 the sorry, the armed forces of the advanced countries, so-called advanced, have degenerated since 1945, that are no longer willing to do what is what is real, the real function, which is to fight and, if necessary, to die. And instead of which, uh, they let soldier, uh, civilians die in their stead. Well, we're at the end of our time. Uh, it's raced by and so on, so it's, it's time to say thank you, Martin, very much to you over there in Germany today, and Philip in uh, Sanford, and, and over here with Jonathan Steele here of the what was once called the Manchester Guardian. Uh, thank you all very much indeed, and right. <laughs> uh, we look forward to hearing from you about these very important views that these three men have had about war, more or less. Still with the subject of... Uh, War. Let's focus now on one war which seems to just go on and on and on, the Darfur conflict in Sudan. Only this, this July, the so-called Doha peace agreement was signed between the Sudanese government and one of the leading rebel groups. 
but the biggest group, the Gem Rebels, refused to sign and vowed to fight on. Alert viewers with good memories will remember my trip to Sudan three years ago. I then spoke to the then head of the UN-African Union Joint Peacekeeping Mission to Darfur, and I asked him why peace was proving just so elusive, indeed absent. Well, three years later, I'm joined now by the new head of the UNAMID mission, Ibrahim Gambari. Welcome. Welcome to be with us, Ibrahim. Thank you very much, uh, Sir uh, David. Would you, from remarks you've made, you think things have got, if better is the right word, better in Darfur recently? Well, because we have uh, a peace agreement. It's not perfect, but although in some ways uh, it was uh, an improvement on the Darfur peace agreement which was signed in Abuja, which is the capital of my own uh, country. So. We now have a peacekeeping mission, which is UNAMID, which I'm privileged to head, that has a peace agreement to implement. Before we had a peacekeeping mission with no peace to keep. So at least we have a step forward and a framework uh, for a peace agreement, not just with the GEM, which is the uh, Justice and Equ Equality Movement that has been described as the biggest uh, armed movement in opposition, but is, is open to others to to join. So the, the challenge facing the international community, in my view, is to persuade the holdout movements, including GEM, to join the peace agreement to give the people of Darfur uh, the peace that they so desperately need. What about the number of, of bombing attacks on Darfur? Now, first they, they oh, seem to have, yeah. have risen to a very high figure no, over, not, overall. Not, not, yes, not recently, but the total number of armed clashes between the government and the, gov uh, and the armed movement resulting in fatalities uh, have uh, drastically reduced from January to, say, July, to almost about 400 fatalities from direct confrontation between the government and the armed movement, and that is way down from what it used to be just a year ago. But, the, <clears throat> but in terms of in terms of the violence, the bombings, and all of these things, you don't talk very much about rape in your reports and so on. But how how serious? How much worse is that? Gender-based violence is a concern. I don't want to diminish because uh, that has been. Uh, initially a tool of the war, yeah. but uh, that is again has uh, subsided uh, significantly. And do you regard President Bashir um, as the greatest of several villains or do you find, you don't presumably see him as a force for good, do you? Well, the, the issue of the ICC, the indictment, is out there. But uh, Sir David, uh, we, are a peace, uh, we are a peacekeeping mission. We are now almost fully deployed. It will be about 30,000 police, uh, uh, military, and civilian. We rely on the government of Sudan uh, in order to do our work. We rely on the government of Sudan not to impede uh, our uh, patrols. We uh, uh, rely on the government of Sudan to deal with criminals who are attacking and killing the peacekeepers. So we have to deal with the government of Sudan, and we are dealing with the government of Sudan. Having said that, uh, Sir David, you have uh, uh, Darfur, which is the size of France, with no infrastructures. So we can't be everywhere every time. So we need to move quickly, we need to move by air, and we need the uh, cooperation of the government in all of this. And they have signed a status uh, of forces agreement uh, with both the African Union and the UN, and we're asking everybody uh, to, imp to implement and that. We, and we, well, thank you very much for being with us. And looking at the figures and too, so on, whereas people often, often over the years say that you are responsible, Darfur, and so on, for an area the size of France, in fact, people have corrected it. It's bigger than that. Yes, absolutely. More difficult because it's the size of Spain. Oh, I see. And, and very little infrastructure. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Sir David. As the financial crisis deepens by the day, Italy being the latest country, of course, threatening the collapse of the Eurozone, what is it going to take to halt the spiralling sort of domino effect that seems to be taking shape in Europe? Should we expect that there is still worse to come? While the Italian Senate votes on fundamental austerity measures demanded by the European Union, I spoke earlier to Finnish Foreign Minister Erki Tuomia. Foreign Minister, Erki, um, tell me, now that the collateral issue is settled, what next needs to be sorted out from Finland's point of view? Well, we share, obviously, the same concerns that everyone. We need to have a, 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 a credible solution for the debt crisis, which entails for Greece 
a debt restructuring so that uh, Greece can make a recovery. And, but it entails uh, for those countries already uh, being supported, Portugal and Ireland, that they uh, keep on to their reforms. And we need to see uh, strong reforms in Italy so as not to have also Italy uh, needing support from the outside. And so the question of Italy raises the point that it's taken some of the attention away from the problems and the travails of Greece because Italy is so much bigger and therefore it's a much bigger problem, is it? Obviously, yes. I mean, that's, we do not have simply the money uh, to... Uh, well, entailing perhaps even a trillion uh, euros. So what we need is a credible government, a credible program uh, for uh, Italy's uh, reforms that the markets can also believe in. But I think that we are also paying the cost that, uh, of uh, doing too little too late. And that originally, uh, one and a half years ago, the first Greek package was not sustainable. Some of us then in opposition in Finland voted against the package because uh, we uh, saw that it would not work and unfortunately we have been right so we have been forced to return to the issue. But now that we have a debt restructuring for Greece on the book, I think that we uh, and hopefully have a credible government in Greece, I think that that party part is now more or less sold. But uh, the whole issue... More, more or less sold, yeah. Well, yes, everything remains to be seen, but uh, <laughs> I think that we are now, as you said, moving on to Italy uh, and uh, the general confidence uh, in, in the Euro countries' uh, economic policies has to be sustained. So what, what does this crisis need to find a clear positive solution? I mean, is there... Do you see, can you see a way ahead to success or not yet? Well, uh, I think we need better leadership, stronger leadership and stronger commitment. But we also need to review uh, what, we have been, what we have been doing, uh, what we have also done wrong. I think that we will be uh, by 2013 perhaps already next year, in a much better situation. When we have the permanent European stability mechanism, when we have the so-called six-pack legislation for economic governance in place, uh, then I think that we are in a position to avoid any future crisis. But getting over there to 2012, that, that is the real issue at the moment. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. In a moment, we'll be talking about the fountain of youth. I'll be talking to a scientist who thinks he can one day re reverse the ageing process and, and perhaps sooner than that, stop it after this short break.